I'm Dr. Michael Patterson, clinical psychologist and EMDR Europe accredited senior trainer. I run trainings and workshops for experienced mental health professionals. In this video, one of them is asking me a particular question. Please join us. Well, my question was about the different types of processing that uh, people, different clients have. I've noticed that some people have the typical passing through of different images and memories, whereas others have more something like a thought process where they interpret or make sense of things or connect things. So when you ask for the feedback, they will typically saying, well, it doesn't seem so bad now because later things got better or somebody cared. Uh, and then a, a, yet a third type of process is where they change the image and say there was an upset mother sitting on a bed, then she starts smiling and they actually rewrite the story by changing the image. So at first I was a little bit concerned because this is sort of a bit divergent from what's described typically in the training. And I found that all those ways of processing seem to work and have a positive value, but possibly some of them are deeper than others. And I just wondered, and I have then encouraged people to not to try and get more into a passive state of mind where they observe the images rather than thinking actively or trying to make sense in a very cognitive, cerebral kind of way. And that's usually helped improve things. But I just wondered what your thoughts and recommendations are about these different types of processing in terms of A, which are most effective or healing, and also how could you maybe, what could you use to encourage clients to uh, find different ways of processing or access those ways of processing that are harder for them, maybe because they tend to be in their head a lot. So any tips okay. really? Yes, which is a great question because it taps into the various different channels that we have. So remember, we, um, I've used the, the hand as a, uh, to represent the memory network. And if you remember, mm -hmm. the, the fingers represent channels of information which are associated with each other. So they're all linked together uh, to form this memory network. So one, one channel could have the sights, the sounds, the smells, the tastes, the sensory aspects. Another, the thoughts we had at the time of the event. Another, the emotions the physical sensations and then the negative self-belief that, that goes with that. So whenever we connect to the memory network, then in the, uh, the, the assessment phase, we're inviting the client then to bring up the picture, the negative words, the uh, emotion, the feeling in the body, and go with that, let whatever happens happen. And those are the key words, let whatever happens happen. Mm -hmm. So a client then might, uh, we're asking them to notice the, the image to start with, the negative cognition, the feeling in the body, and adding in the bilateral stimulation. So they might continue going with the image at this point and not particularly notice the body or uh, the, the negative belief. So although they're, they're processing the visual channel at this point, it's still connecting to the others as well. So we can get that generalization effect. Uh, so then... Uh, have a breath. What do you notice now? If the image is changing, just go with that and then... Have a breath, what do you notice now? The image is changing and or if linked to another image, go with that. So as long as the train's moving down the track, to use the, the train metaphor, then we know processing is taking place. Now, quite rightly, Danny, you're pointing out that sometimes people will get up into their heads and then they're becoming intellectualizing. And if they're intellectualizing the experience, they're staying up here at the cortical level and they're not uh, connecting down here. Mm. So I would say to the client at that point, first of all, okay, well, you're just thinking about that now. Do you notice it anywhere in your body? And often uh, here, by drawing their attention to their body, if they get a resonance, focus on that, which gets them out of their heads and into here. And mm -hmm. uh, now, sometimes when we're in the assessment phase, clients will stay up in their heads as well, but we want them to connect to the memory. And I suppose I'll add in a wee bit about how we might handle that. So part one trainings, I now show a video or currently show a video of a former police officer working on a memory of attending a fatal fire. The two police officers in the car arrived at the house fire uh, before the fire brigade, so they had to do something. So I asked him, can you bring up a picture? And uh, Sam said, oh yes, uh, there's this image I have of the, the gentleman's body being set on the, the, the ground outside. 
as if he was doing a police report mm. and as if I was proceeding down the street and I observed, observed two men as if it happened to somebody else. So in order to process that, he was very much up in his head. Mm. So I asked him, bring up that picture, just noticing the man's body in the ground. What about the lighting additions? Stark, the temperature, there's the heat of the fire. Any smells, you have the smell of burning and it got the smoke. So then he's, uh, so we're now connected to it, making it more visual for the client. That then allows them to connect more to the negative cognition, which resonates the emotion and the feeling in the body and adding in the bilateral stimulation from there. So the important thing would be is the clients, uh, if they get up in their heads and stay up in their heads, it's going to block the processing. But it's okay momentarily for them to have an insight and then maybe another connection and another connection. But we always come back to process as you think about the experience now, what do you get? Uh, so, so that's something that would be, be aware of. I'm not sure if, if I've answered all of the question, Danny. Is, is there any part I haven't yet? Well, maybe a little bit. Yeah, thank you. That, that's helpful. Okay. So maybe just a little bit about the, uh, when they change the imagery and almost uh, create a story or create a, a scene, a very brief scene where... Okay things change. Uh, I mean, my supervisor has said, well, yeah, that's fine. That's another way of processing. And, mm -hmm. I don't know. Just any thoughts on that? Yes. So let's think of an example. So then say, let's say the client is working on this image of having been beaten by their teacher in school. And there's this child uh, crying in the corner, the teacher standing over hitting the child. And uh, the child can't fight back. The child can't run away. And it's a case of freeze and submit. So Normally, uh, if, pro if the train keeps moving down the track, then uh, we can add in the bilateral stimulation and then it might ease, the image might fade, come more distant and the client feels the, the body relaxing. Mm -hmm. That would be great. But what we can do is, or maybe the client will do this themselves, they might see them as the adult walking into the room. So let's say this could come spontaneously from the client. Them as the adult, who they are now, walks into the room, grabs the teacher by the throat, and punches the teacher, takes the child by the hand, and takes the child out of the room. Mm -hmm. So is that the sort of scenario that you're yeah, thinking for of? for example, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Do you know what I would say? Go with that, mm -hmm. add in a bilateral stimulation. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely, because uh, why that would be, and I suppose I'll explain it, uh, because mm -hmm. if we think about uh, the client who, working in this childhood memory, it was them at maybe age six or seven being beaten by the teacher, stuck in time. They, as an adult, maybe in their 20s or 30s, 40s, 50s, or whatever, they could be in their 70s uh, in uh, our room. So where the client then is now connecting this adaptive memory that, hang on, I'm now a an adult who can fight back. I'm an adult who can run away. I can do things now that I couldn't do as a child. So they're connecting this information and then seeing themselves as the adult coming into the room and rescuing the child and taking the child out. In the circumstances where it doesn't happen spontaneously, you as the therapist then can invite the client, okay, what age are you now? I'm 40. So if you, the 40 year old, could walk into that room, what would you do? I would stop the teacher hitting him. And what would you do then? I'd take the child out, okay. Just see yourself as the 40 year old going into that room and doing what you feel, and saying and doing what you feel you need to do. Let me know when you're done. Add in the bilateral stimulation. So we can use that then as a cognitive interweave for the client then to see themselves going in and doing uh, what they are now able to do that they weren't able to do then. The reason being the, memory, the child is, is the adult is stuck with that child's memory because of the thwarted fight or flight response and it's not clearing spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So we can be quite creative in what we do uh, as a cognitive interweave then. Yeah. That so, makes sense. And I've even, yeah, I've, I've done things like that myself. Yeah. So when it's stuck, it's, it can be good to bring in that adaptive mm -hmm. idea. What would have actually resolved the situation or. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and it's a similar situation with looking into the child's eyes from that look in the child's eyes. What do you feel the child needs? So if it's not shifting spontaneously, then we can link into that. And, and then uh, it could be somebody to take her out of there. Okay, could you, the adult, do that? Yes, I could. So then just see yourself taking the child out. Thank so you. Thanks, Danny.